All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I am. My name is Christine Swan. I'm the director of counseling for Saracoso. Um, everybody will kind of introduce themselves as we go. Um, the first person I'm going to introduce is Karee Hamilton. Um, and um, if you have questions throughout our presentation, feel free to enter them in the chat, but we will specifically leave time at the end for questions and address them all individually and specifically. Thank you. All right, Karee? great. Thanks, Christine. Um, all right, so welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Karee Hamilton. I'm the counselor at the Saracoso Tehachapi campus. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get us started. So, Christine, you can go to the next slide. Great. So, we um, want to define what dual and concurrent enrollment are. They are two separate things. So, I just want to make sure we're all clear on that. Um, but first of all, dual and concurrent enrollment is an opportunity for high school students to earn college credit while they're still in high school. And at Saracosta, like I said, we do offer dual and we do offer concurrent enrollment. The difference between the two is that dual enrollment classes are offered at the high school during the high school day. So it's basically one of the students' high school class periods and it's taught by a high school instructor who meets the minimum qualification to teach our Saracoso college classes. Concurrent enrollment um, is basically completed on the student's own time. So it's after the high school day is over. Um, a student can take college classes at one of our Saracoso campuses or online. For either dual or concurrent enrollment, the enrollment fees are waived. That's $46 a unit that the student doesn't have to pay. But we do have material fees for some of our classes. An example of that would be our art classes, welding classes. Um, the material fees are not waived and they do have to be paid for by the student. There's also a $2 student representation fee that's charged to all college students, but when a student completes their update form each semester, they can check a box on the update form that automatically waives this fee if the student chooses not to pay it. Some other costs to be aware of are textbooks. Many of our instructors have made a great efforts to reduce the cost of textbooks by offering either free textbooks or reduced cost textbooks. If your student participates in dual enrollment at the high school, the high school will give them the book that they need. If your student's participating in concurrent enrollment, then the student is responsible for purchasing a textbook if it's required. Okay, next slide, Christine. So why we think dual enrollment is a good opportunity. Um, so we have some great examples here. Um, so the first one I wanna talk about is that it expands curriculum options. So an example of this would be if the high school that your student attends doesn't have like a specific art class that they wanna take, or welding or a language class, then your student can take the class with Saracoso. They also gain exposure to college and the college environment. So when a student is exposed to college early on while they're still in high school, then a lot of times there's no fear of the unknown and increases the likelihood that they'll continue on to college after high school. Some dual enrollment options allow students to be career ready, such as one of our short-term training opportunities like our medical assisting program, emergency medical technician or, or EMT, and welding, just to name a few. And depending on the program and the availability of classes, high school students could finish a short-term training opportunity, opportunity by the time they finish high school and be ready to start a career. Another benefit is that it saves money. As mentioned before, the $46 unit tuition fee is waived. So essentially the only cost to the student are textbooks if the student's taking classes as concurrent enrollment. Dual enrollment, the high school does purchase the textbooks. So depending on the number of college classes your student takes while they're in high school, it could save quite a bit of money. 
So saving money is important, but equally important is saving time. If your student takes just four college classes while they're in high school, that's equivalent to one semester in college. If they took eight classes while in high school, that's equivalent to two semesters or basically one year of college. Most of the high schools that we work with, um, they allow students to earn both high school and college credit. Um, so for example, if a student takes US history with Saracoso, it could potentially uh, fulfill the high school US history requirement as well. Just make sure that you talk to these options with the high school counselor to make sure that um, credit can be given uh, for high school as well. It makes for an easier transition to high school or to college after high school. As mentioned before, students who gain exposure to college and the college environment early on, uh, it increases the likelihood that they'll continue with college after high school. So students are aware of their potential and they know that they can be successful in college classes because, well, they've been going to college already. All right, next slide. Oh, thank you. So while we think um, dual and concurrent enrollment is a good opportunity, there are some things to consider before having your, your student take classes. So dual enrollment, again, are the, the classes that your student takes during their high school day one of their class periods. If a student's not doing well and decides to drop the college part of the class, um, then they may not be able to get into a different high school class for that term, which could impact their schedule. But in most cases though, if a student decides to drop the college course, they can remain in the high school class and they'll only receive high school credit. But we always encourage students to talk to the high school counselor before they consider dropping a class. Concurrent enrollment um, are the classes um, that you take outside of the high school day. So either at one of our campuses or online. Just keep in mind that college is not the same as high school and concurrent enrollment high school students are in class with adults on campus and, in, and online. And they must adhere to the student conduct policy for the college. Students that take college classes online may think wonderful, I can do this class whenever I want to. The truth is online is more time consuming than on campus classes. Online classes require a significant amount of reading and participation. So even though yes, online is wonderful because you have the freedom of doing the class when you want to, our online classes are not self-paced, which means there are deadlines to adhere to. Motivation and time management are key to being successful in an online class. As mentioned before, college classes are different than high school classes and may be more challenging than what the student's used to. Therefore, if a student gets a B in the college class, which is a great grade, by the way, it could impact their high school GPA. Another thing to consider are the textbook costs. As I mentioned, many of our instructors are trying to find low cost or no cost options for textbooks, but sometimes it can't be done in um, textbooks can get expensive sometimes for our concurrent enrollment students. Keep in mind that for both dual and concurrent enrollment um, students, they're creating their college transcripts and grades in college are permanent and they will follow students wherever they go. An unsatisfactory grade may impact financial aid and scholarship opportunities in the future and possibly admittance to university. Um, next slide. So we want all of our students to be successful and we have some amazing resources to assist them. And college students are responsible for seeking out these support services and utilizing them. In college, we don't give out progress reports. So if your student is struggling, have them talk to their high school counselor or come and have them talk to a Saracoso counselor or, or advisor at the college. We're here to support our students, but we don't know if they're struggling until they say something. So communication is important. Communication with the college counselors and advisors is important, but equally important is communication with their college instructors. Students need to communicate when they need help, if they have questions, or even just to discuss the class a little bit further. All of our instructors have office hours, 
Usually that means time before class starts or after class um, and to meet with students. All of our campuses and online are equipped with a tutoring center, typically for math and English. But I tell students that you don't have to be in math or English to access one of our tutors. If um, students have a history or psychology paper that they need to write and they want somebody to take a look at it, an English tutor could look at it. Or if they're trying to solve a math problem for a science class, then a math tutor can help. Tutoring is free for all of our students that are enrolled at Saracoso. The last resource is um, research papers. They are very common in most of our college classes. So if your student has a research paper that they need to work on and they, they don't even know how to get started, have them connect with one of our librarians online or on campus. Next slide. Okay. So on the screen here, you can see um, several recommendations that we have for dual and concurrent enrollment. And I'm just gonna highlight a few of them. So purchasing textbooks. In college, students are expected to have their books and materials the first week of class. This again will be something to consider for concurrent enrollment students who are taking classes outside of the high school day. Students need to check their college email regularly and even more so if they're taking online classes um, college email is the only email that we use at the college to communicate with students. So if a student sends an email through his or her personal email, it might go unanswered. The reason for this is we have to confirm that we are talking with the student and the way to do this is um, through their college email that's been assigned to them. For online students, they must log in on the first day of class. And if they don't, they might be dropped from the class. The syllabus is one of the most important documents that students get from their instructors on the first day of class. It outlines the class, the expectations, grading policy, assignment information, assignment due dates, and so on. So encourage your student to keep it handy throughout the semester. The rule of thumb on how much to spend on a college class in regards to time is that for each unit that a class has, students should spend two to three hours on homework each week for that class. So for example, a three unit history class, a student should expect to spend around six to nine hours uh, outside of class each week doing homework, reading projects, and et cetera. So we roughly say about an hour each day for a college class, if not more. If your student cannot dedicate that time to a college class, then they may wanna wait until they can. And then the last thing again is communication. Communicate problems immediately. We'll, we will not know anything's wrong until a student says something. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna pass it, pass it over to Ashley. Thank you, Curry. My name is Ashley Thompson. I am one of the educational advisors at um, the Ridgecrest campus. I work with uh, students that are in the area and students that request the online courses. Um, so I'm going to start by just, you know, providing some tips to students that are going to um, assist them in being uh, being successful online. So first, we suggest that students take the College 52 class. Uh, and pretty much this class focuses on teaching skills um, on how to be a successful online student. As Korea had mentioned before, online classes can take more time. Um, it takes more initiative from the student because there's not that professor there in front of the student teaching that content. And so taking this class can really uh, be beneficial in teaching skills on how to um, organize, manage that time, um, and complete those online courses that a student may register in uh, successfully. 
Now, when it comes to starting uh, taking classes, we usually suggest that students start to about one to two courses. Um, college courses tend to have a much higher load than high school classes. And so starting off one to two can really be a good transition for, for a student who's used to a high school load that starts in college. Um, when you get up to the three classes, it can really be overwhelming. So we usually suggest that students start off with one to two. Um, please work with your high school counselor and you can work with us at Saracoso to choose appropriate courses uh, and then understand why and when to withdraw from a course. So we're going to get uh, into this information a little bit deeper in a moment, but just know that it is the student's responsibility to drop a class. Um, there are requirements that, you know, you need to be active within the first couple of weeks and the professor or the professor will drop you, but that's not always guaranteed. And so if you know that you need to drop a class, it's very important that you provide written requests to admissions and records uh, to drop the class. Um, I also do get the request, but the reason why I say admissions and records is, you know, if I'm not in office, um, obviously that, that request is going to hang out a little bit. So we don't want that. So definitely reach out to admissions and records if you are wanting to drop a class. Um, so a counselor advisor will discuss the implications of dropping a course. There are some things to consider. So we'll, depending on your situation and your goal uh, for taking the course, uh, you know, then we'll talk about that. Um, and your high school counselor cannot drop your course. So please reach out to Saracoso if you're wanting to drop your course. Next slide, please. All right, so there are some course restrictions and some limitations for concurrent and dual students. And so we're just gonna review those real quick. Um, so course content legislation and or department recommendations place restrictions on some courses for high school students. So this is actually chosen by the departments. Um, and so first instance of this is students must be 14 or older to take a PE course. And our PE courses, um, do have a percentage limitation on how many concurrent students can take those. So right now the current limitation is 15. So once 15% of that course becomes concurrent students, we have to put a cap on that and we can no longer um, enroll future students, uh, in students into that course not future students, more students into that course for that semester. Um, also some CTE courses, so career technical education courses are restricted based on age or safety. So an instance of that is the health careers. Um, and then also language other than language is usually not recommended for summer. Um, so just from my experience, uh, a lot of times if a student requests Spanish class in the summer, um, you know, they are experiencing a very high load of work. Please keep in mind that our summer semesters are eight weeks compared to our full semesters, which are 16 weeks. And so the courses that they take during the summer are going to fill, uh, the workload is almost going to feel doubled because that's so compacted. And so with the high unit course like Spanish, you know, five units in the summer, it can be very overwhelming. So please just consider that um, when report requesting language classes um, in general, and especially Spanish, uh, please consider taking it during a, a longer semester so you have more chance of being successful. Now there are some prerequisites or co-requisites for our courses. Uh, prerequisites are classes that you'll need to complete before taking a course. They pretty much prepare you for you know, uh, a course that's, you know, later on down the line. So let's look at English, English 101 and English 102. English 101 needs to be completed before English 102 because you're going to learn the skills in English 101 that you need to be successful in English 102. So that's why it's a requirement. And so that's why there's prerequisites in place and we need to ensure that students are meeting those so they have the highest chance of success in the courses they're requesting. There are also co-requisites. Co um, these aren't super common at Saracoso, but there are some classes that say, you know what, okay, if you didn't complete the class that we want before this class, at least complete it alongside it. And so that's what a co-requisite is. They need to at least take it alongside that course. Next slide, please. Now, here are some course recommendations um, that we do have for students. These uh, 
tend to be successful given the demographics that they're suggested on. So for first time students, freshmen, sophomores, we usually suggest this list here. As you can see, there's some art courses, business technology classes. We have our college success courses. Um, you know, there's a nutrition course, IT music courses. So these are the courses that we've seen that first time students, freshmen, sophomores have done very successfully in. Next, we have our first time students who are juniors or seniors. So these students have had a bit more of that high school experience. They're probably used to a higher load. They may have some education that'll better prepare them for this list here. So um, we tend to see that students within these demographics do better um, with this list of courses here. And then same with the continuing students. These are junior seniors who have shown previous success. So they've taken classes with us before. Now these are suggestions based on what we have seen as are successful for these specific groups of students. But just keep in mind, this isn't a hard fast rule. If you see a class that's in another list, you can request that class. If there's no prerequisites, we can go ahead and have a discussion, uh, you know, based on the workload, if you have any questions about that. So just know these are suggestions based off what we have seen that students are successful in. Next slide, please. Now, here we're gonna get a little bit more into the details of dropping courses. So when it comes to dropping classes, I said before, we do need it in writing. Um, but a couple things to keep in mind are not only the, uh, the request needs to be in writing, but also please pay attention to the drop dates of the courses. It's very important. The first drop date is going to be a refund date. That's not going to apply to concurrent and dual students because you're not responsible for the cost of the course, only the textbooks. So you would not be getting a refund back. So the first date that you're going to want to pay attention to is the census date. This is also called the drop without a W date. And so this is a time during the semester where if you drop before this day, it's not going to show on your transcripts that you even attempted the course. Um, and so this is kind of for students who are like, hey, I took this class. I don't really think that it's a good fit for me, or, you know, maybe the class wasn't what they thought it was, maybe there's a conflict schedule. And so, you know, those are some of the instances that, that I run into when it comes to needing to drop students at this point in the semester. Um, there's also the final drop date, and this is also called drop with W date. So this is the drop date where after the drop without a W date passes, right in between that final drop date, the last day you can drop classes, you can drop a course, but you will get a W on your transcript. And that pretty much just symbolizes on the transcript that you withdrew from the class. And so a few instances where we see students request this is if they realize they're not doing well in the course and they would rather take the W than a failing grade. And so just please keep in mind that when that drop with the W date passes, then you can no longer drop from the course. And so the final grade that you get in that class is what is gonna show on your transcripts. Next slide, please. All right, so Ws, what are the implications of withdrawing from a course? So withdrawing from a course may impact your high school progress. If it's a class that you're taking to fulfill your A through G requirements, then you'll want to meet with your counselor um, at high school if you've dropped from the class because it could potentially you know, affect your progress. You'll need to discuss whether you maybe need to take the class in the future and what that's gonna look like. Um, the W is on your official college record. Super important to keep in mind, any college classes you take, if you don't withdraw before that W date, it's gonna show that you've at least attempted the class, the W is gonna stay on your transcripts. W is an indicator of academic progress at Saracoso. And so you do need to complete a certain amount of units. So 50% of units at least um, that you attempt with us to remain in good academic standing. And so let's say you, you know, attempted 12 units, just overall, um, at least six of those units you need to pass um, and complete uh, and not withdraw from for you to be at 50%. Um, also keep in mind, this could affect financial aid in the future as well. So you want to try to keep withdrawals to a minimum. Um, also, because this last point here, uh, you know, future college admissions, depending on the college that you're going through, going to, they may not want to see uh, multiple W's on your transcript. So just keep that in mind. Next slide. Thank you. All right. So next is Family Education Rights and Privacy Act. 
FERPA. All right, so this act, this federal law pretty much states that as a college student, which every student who registers for a college class and attends a college class is deemed a college student, um, no matter the age. So even if a student is under 18, they're deemed as a college student. And so they're protected by this federal law. And it pretty much states that if parents, guardians, anyone outside of the student wants to be involved in the student's account. So if they want to attend counseling, um, appointments, receive information, uh, we do need releases of information and consent from the student. Um, and so just important to keep in mind that, you know, when we're meeting with students, the students do need to be active, even if we have this FERPA on file, because the information that we do release is still on a need to know, because this is a federal law. I know it sounds odd, because I know that a lot of our concurrent students are under 18, so it kind of doesn't make sense with a lot of the rules that are in place elsewhere. Um, but it's just something that we need to have to abide by. So just please know that, you know, we'll, we'll request consent from the student. Um, and then I'll, we'll also send them these forms if, um, if they want someone else, parent, guardian, or someone else involved in their um, educational experience. Yeah. Next slide, please. All right, so steps for enrollment. Uh, so this is pretty much how you're going to get enrolled in classes um, with Sarah Coso. So you're gonna meet with your high school counselor and pretty much talk about the concurrent dual program, check to see if taking a concurrent course or a dual course is right for you. Uh, and then you'll also work with the high school counselor and you can also meet with us as well to look at classes um, that you wanna take, but then also for placement into English or math. So if you're wanting to take English or math, we'll have to go through what's called a placement process. Um, and then also you'll want to complete the application for Saracoso if you haven't yet. Now, if you've already applied, you don't need to apply again. You'll just need to do your update form. An update form needs to be completed before every semester. So before you even request courses, please complete your update form. Because I ran into situations where students are requesting classes that are like filling up very quickly and the update form isn't completed. And so when we go to try to get the student in the class because it's not completed, we can't get them in. And so to prevent any delays, please complete the update form. And then also now our process has changed and Kristen is going to review that on the next slide here. Uh, but we are now going through dualenroll.com. Uh, so you're definitely going to want to create an account uh, so that you can request courses through there. And then we'll also be sending out the instructions on how you can do that. Um, let me see here. So private school affidavit. So if you are at a private homeschool, um, it's super important that when you are requesting courses, you're also submitting your private school affidavit. It has to be for the most recent year. I believe in October is when they sent out the 20 year for 22 year. Um, so we do need the most recent year. We can't move forward with processing the forms um, if we don't have a private school affidavit for private homeschool students. And now I'll turn it over to Kristen. Thank you. I'm actually going to jump in real quick before okay. Kristen. And um, hold on, I'm trying to escape from the screen. I'm going to show everybody real quick where you can find the dualenroll.com information. And then Kristen will get into kind of the details of that. Can everybody still see my screen okay? Um, or I just want to make sure I wasn't sharing just the PowerPoint. Can no, we see can the, see. We can okay. see the website. Yeah. Okay. So on our website, um, if and the way I got here was you go to saracoso.edu and then you go to admissions and records and then you go to for current high school students and it will bring you to this lovely page. And from this page, you can access, um, there's a number of things you can access from here. You can access the application. You can also access what Ashley was talking, the extremely important update form and how to get there. Um, current students who need to do their update form can go through Inside CC and log in and go under tools and do their update form. Um, just quickly adding that, that was not planned, but um, what I wanted to point out is the information on our dualenroll.com 
Um, one of the things you can um, do for, so I provided it, um, and by the way, I'm sorry, we'll be sending out the PowerPoint to everybody so you will have all this information on hand. So anybody in attendance will be sending this out so you'll have all the links. Um, but the Saracosos dual enroll.com account is linked right here. So this will take you to where you need to create your account. Um, and it takes you to this page. It looks like this. And if you have an account, you just use your username and password to log in. Kristen, if I'm doing any of this wrong, you can just jump in and correct me. Um, if you are, if you do not have account, then you create your account from here. And then if you go back to this page, there's also a link for instructions right here. And when you click on this, this beautiful or beautiful document here opens up that provides you step-by-step -step instructions on how to create a dual enroll.com account and kind of gives you some screenshots of what to do in each area. And so you can follow all those instructions. Um, I'm gonna let Kristen get into more of the nitty gritty and detail, but I wanted to make sure everybody knew where to access that information. And now I, I knew I was not gonna be able to do it from the current slides. <laughs> Hold on a second. There we go. Kristen, all okay. you. <laughs> okay, um, my name is Kristen Hanley and I'm the dual enrollment campus manager. Um, so this is the process for um, completing the forms. If you decide you wanna take class, obviously you do need to do the application as was discussed earlier or update. And then you basically will log on to dualenroll.com and set up a profile. That's the first step in this process, that profile Basically, it's general information about you as the student. So you're, you're listing your high school. You're going to list your parent information because the parent does have to agree and obviously um, support and sign off on the fact that you are going to be taking a dual enrollment or concurrent class. So that's the first thing that happens is you set up a profile, as I said, just general information. Then that profile comes to the college. At the college, it's what we call a college review. We go ahead and review everything to make sure that your student ID is there, meaning your college ID is there, that um, you're a US citizen, that you're um, registered correctly, and that you're not on probation. Everything checks out, then we go ahead and send you to um, go ahead and register for classes. So then the application comes back to you as the student, you then go through and pick your courses. Um, and at that point, um, once you pick your courses, then it goes um, to your counselor. Um, and in the meantime, while you're picking your courses, the parent consent is also out there. Um, and the parent consent, obviously we'd like that signed as soon as possible, but what we do find is sometimes it takes a few times um, to get the attention of the parent. And I will tell you that information is from your student. They basically go in and either enter an email address for you or a telephone number and we can text you. Okay, by the way, can you uh, approve this? So as I said, that's going on at the same time. Um, but in the meantime, then it goes to the high school counselor. They sign off on it um, for whatever class. They'll load the transcript if a transcript is needed. And then it comes to the college. And depending on if it's a dual enrollment class, our systems will automatically enroll your student in the class. Or if it's a concurrent, we have staff then then will manually enroll the students. Once you're enrolled, then there is an automatic email that goes out to you saying that you are now enrolled in the classes. Um, so it's a great, this is a great process. I will tell you all, if you are used to our old process, it was, it was obviously very paper intensive. This seems to be moving a lot faster. Um, it's just trying to get used to the process. Um, so I would say, just be patient with it. Um, definitely reach out to us. Um, and I think maybe my email might be at the end, but I know our early college um, at saracoso.edu also as a resource. Um, but as I said, I think 
going forward. I think everyone's really going to like it. It's just getting through this first semester. Um, and then everyone will be like, oh my gosh, this is a breeze. It's so easy. And that's all for me. Okay, passing along to, hold on, let me get to the next slide. Passing along to Anthony. Hello, everyone. My name is Anthony Briseno. I'm an educational advisor from the Tatchby campus. So um, as Kristen was explaining, pretty much the registration process. And once you've actually gotten in. Sorry, just muted on that, but it, yeah. <laughs> there are a few things I'm getting used to my keyboard, I guess. Get, uh, there are a few things that you would you should do once your student has enrolled. So um, prior to actually attending class, we definitely recommend checking email. Sometimes the professors will send out emails the week prior or the weeks up to coming to the class to notify the student of, you know, sometimes they'll send them the syllabus, sometimes they'll send them just important class information. That's really imperative. So we always tell you know the students definitely check their emails to confirm that they've been enrolled and any instructions moving forward for the class. Uh, they can check also inside CC. Uh, that's pretty much where they'll be uh, where they'll be able to access their email. Uh, but they'll also be able to check the inside CC to see if they've actually enrolled in the correct class. Uh, the reason why this is very important is we've had it in the past where students enroll in the wrong class or they meant to enroll in online and instead they're you know they enrolled to the class all the way Anthony you muted it again I don't know what's going on this is okay I'm gonna push away my keyboard a little um so we, we definitely want to make sure that uh when it comes to enrolling in the correct class they take the time to make sure that uh, typically uh, this can be avoided um, by speaking with the counselors, sometimes we'll provide them with the correct CRN to ensure that this doesn't happen because it's happened hundreds of times, if not thousands, I'm sure. Um, also, we want to definitely make sure if a student is a concurrent enrollment student, definitely purchase the textbooks. Uh, it does take time. So depending on where you're at, um, you know, you definitely want to give yourself time to purchase the books uh, beforehand. You don't want to start a class and then purchase the book and then it take time to get there, and then you're already falling behind, uh, especially with these college courses. Some of them kick up pretty fast, so we definitely don't recommend waiting on that. Um, also, if the class is online, uh, typically the Friday prior, so if the class starts on Monday, the Friday prior, typically around 12, the class becomes uh, available to access. We definitely recommend logging in uh, prior to the first day. Uh, sometimes there's information, sometimes there's there's important resources, but it's also just to detect activity. Um, if the student, for some reason, something happens on the first day of school and they forget and they didn't log in or they didn't, weren't active, uh, in some cases they have been dropped for due to inactivity. So to avoid all this, we definitely recommend at least you know participating or engaging in the online course. Uh, sometimes it's something as simple as a discussion, like introduce yourself or just interact with it with the thing, just so they know that the student is engaged. Um, also, just like if it was online, um, you definitely want to attend if the, it is an in-person class. Definitely want to attend the first day of class. Uh, yeah, but, you know, as all things, <clears throat> sorry, let me get some more. As all things, though, you know, life happens. If for some reason the student can attend the first day of class, we definitely recommend communicating with the professor to let them know. It is up to the professor's discretion, however, so that that is just a little caveat that I'd like to mention. But um, it's definitely important to attend the first day of class or you take the risk of chance of being dropped from that class. Also, as I mentioned regarding syllabus, sometimes it's sent out, sometimes it's attached to the class or sometimes it's given out in, during the class. Um, the syllabus in, uh, pretty much contains important information such as drop dates, due dates, and also assignments. We definitely want uh, the students to be aware of all these things as you know it happens as due dates come up or whatever might be the case as far as drop dates, uh, something might happen, the student might be testing it out. They definitely wanna know whether they can withdraw and avoid the W, whether they can withdraw, whether they will withdraw with the W or whether it's too late past that point. And the most important thing, as I mentioned, communicate with the instructors. Uh, we understand that things are out of control sometimes with, you know, life, some things happen. Uh, it's very important to stay in constant communication with the instructors, um, especially when needed, like when something can happen, if it is in person, they can't attend, 
or if it's online and you know they, for some reason they're unable to access a certain program or they're not able to complete a certain assignment, we just recommend maintaining the constant communication just to ensure that the instructor knows what's going on. Can you go on to the next? Thank you. So the biggest part of you know my job as well as many of the counselors is that you know when it comes down to uh, an education plan, we always recommend a student meeting with us and getting an education plan. Um, as a college student, they have free reign of determining what classes they want. Um, but so often, uh, something that I realize, and I'm pretty sure many of uh, my colleagues can recommend and, and speak on also, is that students will take multiple classes in the same area, but have no interest in actually studying that area for a major. And uh, it kind of limits, at that point, the opportunities they have as far as making the most out of these classes, because they're only allowed 11 units per semester. Normally, if they're taking all in one area and they've already completed that area, it kind of, at that point, just, you know, it's just adding on the units. It's no longer uh, fulfilling other areas of requirements. So sometimes we try to recommend doing an education plan. That way we can let them know, okay, during the fall, you should take these courses, you know, spring these courses. If you want to take some of these courses, uh, many students that end up completing an associate's degree um, during, while they're still in high school create an education plan at a very early point. So in their, typically in their freshman year, they, they knew they wanted an AA at the same time when they finish a high school degree. So they typically get together with us and they end up creating an education plan depending on the major. Uh, it is also important to know that certain degrees and majors are not available online. Um, so there might be a limitation on that. Uh, it has happened where students want a certain degree, but geographically and, and time-wise, they're not able to take certain classes. So it's very important that they understand uh, meeting with the educational advisor so we can, or a counselor, so we can at least sit down with them and figure out what's plausible, what courses are available, and that way we can make sure they take the right courses to get them to where they want to go. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, well, I was yeah right there. Okay. Also, um, a main point is also identifying careers and majors. Um, so you know sometimes we might not have a major that a student wants, and that should not be a point of you know of disinterest. It's like oh well I'm not going to take any college classes uh, because they can still focus on gen ed. But more importantly, we can actually identify what major or what career they might want. We can kind of what I you know why I say like back plan it. You know, plan out from there here, what can we do as far as getting them closest to that point? Um, most times the community colleges, although it's very limited, we can take majority of the preparatory classes that are needed for that major and get them to the point of once they graduate, they at least have completed a good portion, if not all the prerequisites in order to get to that point. Go on to the next slide, please. So we have access to uh, the, the handbook for students and parents and guardians. So this is very useful. I still refer to it often, even though uh, during my job, I feel like I need to know all this stuff already, but I always double check this as a resource. Uh, and it has important information as far as, you know, at our drop policies, um, you know, how to do unit, how to request a unit over, unit limit override. I believe that's the correct term. Um, it has information as far as resources and additional academic information that I always recommend. You know, I refer to it, especially when a student has a, just a general question. Sometimes I'll check here first. Um, it might save you, I don't know, maybe a few minutes, hours, or even days of response if you refer to this first before, you know, trying to reach out. Um, again, I don't not trying to dissuade anyone from reaching out, but sometimes you might find your answer already in this book booklet, and it might provide you with a little more quicker response than you know if you email us on a Friday and we won't get back to you on a Monday type you know type of event. And I believe that is yes. All right, good. Thank you, Anthony. Um, so um, that's the end of our presentation, um, but we are going to hang out here for questions. So if you want to put your question in the chat or if you just want to unmute yourself and ask your question, um, you can, you're welcome to do that. But also on this last slide here um, are our 
phone numbers for our different campuses. So based on your location, you'd want to contact the campus nearest you. So um, you're welcome to take a picture of that just so you have that information. It is available on our website. And we will be sending out the PowerPoint um, to everybody who registered for the workshop tonight. And we'll post the recording once it's finished. Um, I'm going to stop recording right now for a minute. Um, if I could figure, actually, I'll figure it out in a minute. But um, I do want to let everybody know um, we will send out the recording. We will send out the PowerPoint um, to respond to Wendy's question. Um, these are the numbers to call depending on where you live and or whether you're an online student. And you can also, um, the early college email is more for assistance with dualenroll.com. Um, if you have specific questions about the types of courses to take, things like that, you're better off calling the specific campuses. Um, but um, if you do email that, Kristen will forward the information to an appropriate counselor as well. Um, you, um, we will send this PowerPoint that has um, the recommended classes. Um, I also, I'll stop sharing for a minute and just share, or hold on, let me reshare my screen, but show you our website again. If you go to our website at the bottom of the page I showed you before that has a, our admissions and records and then for current high school students, if you go to the bottom, you can access our handbook there on concurrent and dual enrollment. It's both listed in English and Spanish. And if you open the handbook, and it may take a minute because it load, it takes a little bit to load. On page, um, I'm not sure if this entirely answers this question, but on the pages towards the back, it lists the recommended classes that we um, recommend for freshmen, sophomore, junior, seniors. Um, so these are also listed in the handbook. Um, but the other way to really select your courses is to meet with a college um, counselor or, to, or advisor, especially if your student um, is interested. You know, we have a lot of students that are interested in earning their associate's degree at the same time as their high school diploma. And so if they're really looking at that track and wanting to um, build an education plan around that track and they have a specific goal in mind of the type of degree, then it's really important to meet with us so that we can really guide them into which classes they need, which general education pattern they should follow and that kind of thing. And I'm just gonna look at the chat for a second. Right now I'm gonna pause the recording though and we will post this, but we'll continue to answer any questions anybody has. <laughs> 